Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back with the wrist strap and the cardboard box. And this came from Tom Mead, something to look at, try and fix, and send back to him. Uh, actually, two things. I may do them both within this video. The other one is the Epson floppy drive you saw in a previous video. I know exactly what's wrong with this. It's that blooming button. And I may be part of the issue here, because I mentioned if you adjust the button, I know you can't see it, trust me, the button's there somewhere. If you adjust the button, the metal part, bend it, it then stops reading discs. You straighten it back out stuff, it reads discs again, but then the button's crooked. So I think I could be wrong, but I just vague recollections. So when I packaged it up, I just tweaked the position of that button, thinking, oh, I hope that hasn't moved out of alignment. So I'm got it back and went, it's out of alignment, it's not working. So I think that's what that is. So uh, yeah, that's why I've offered to look at that. I feel responsible, really. So yeah, this is a scaler, a, well, it says there, deinterlace. Obviously it's got a borked connector here. That might be all that's wrong with this, I don't know. That knob there's broken off, isn't it? I don't know what that is. Oh, it's a potentiometer, isn't it, I think? Yeah, I think that's supposed to be a potentiometer, so we've got that broken. And we've got uh, a DC jack horse. Uh, not really a DC jack, probably a uh, 3.5 millimeter one. I don't know. I'm trying to read what that says there. I can't read it from here. But anyway, other than uh, the obviously damage here and the fact, oh, <laughs> that's just fell off. And I don't think there's a plate with it unless it's in the bag. Yeah, so I don't know. Is that all that's wrong with it? I mean, it looks a bit crusty, doesn't it? Look at the solder and flux there. That's a VGA connector, so there you go, that's your de isn't it? It's a uh, scan doubler, is the word I was looking for earlier. Yeah, so we'll see what we can do with this. I think the first thing I might try and do is work out what this actually is. You know, there's no branding or anything on it, is there? There's no branding. Because it would help if I could understand what these were. Yeah, what are those for? I am assuming that that is 3.5mm. But then why would you plug 3.5mm connectors into this? I don't get it. I can understand plugging that into the video slot on a 2000 and then getting video out of here. But what's this all about? What is that all about? So before I go on a wild goose chase, let's just uh, try something in there. So I've got the wrist strap on again here. I've got a uh, headphone jack here, you know, some earphones. Yeah, that's what it is, isn't it? You can see that. This is the switched contact here on the end. So just looking on the inside, I've got three contacts. Yeah, the switch one doesn't seem to be doing anything unless it's on the top side. It is literally just these outer ones. So that goes to the long part on a 3.5 mil socket. Yeah, um, and the top contact goes to the middle. So it's those end two. It's the end one in the middle, end in the middle. Yeah, and that obviously disconnects. So that's exactly what that is. That one is the same, I think. Yeah. So we've got two of those. I'm wondering if it's audio in, audio out, and then you've got a volume knob, and it amplifies the audio, perhaps. So that way you get amplified audio, and you get deinterlaced video. That might be what's going on. I've lost that bit of metal now. There it is. I can stick some uh, hex things on that after. I might ask Tom if he's got the original ones. I don't know. Uh, and he may have the plate that goes with this. Honestly, no idea. It's pretty wide, that, though, isn't it? It could be quite difficult getting something that would accommodate that, because it sticks out further than this. It'd be quite a wide connector. Anyway, I guess that's not that important. You could 3D print something or anything for that, really. So, the question is, can we replace this? Well, the positions of this pot here are a bit weird, aren't they? It's like one, two, three, four, five, six. Trying to find something with that footprint for the, you know, a potentiometer is going to be pretty difficult. And I'm guessing it's stereo. That's what I think, yeah, that's why we've got all six connections used here. It's like left and right, so we need to find something. Now, what we can do with that is drill holes through the board, epoxy it on or something, and stick some wires to map it. And that might be the answer with these as well. We may not be able to source a replacement, one of those, but I would check with Tom first and say, look, we ain't going to be able to get a replacement, but what I can do is glue the new connectors on, yeah, after I've drilled one or two additional holes to accommodate the different footprint. Because I think trying to find something with this three footprint like that, in terms of, you know, a mono jack like that. Mind you, this is the other thing. If this was audio, why is it not stereo? Why would it be mono audio? I don't see any value in that. 
There's no connection on the end here, is there? Maybe there's something missing from this, but there's only three connections, and we know that one of them is the switch one. Yeah, so it must be mono audio there. We're not missing a connection here or anything. So, it's a bit strange, isn't it? So I've got the Rev 6A 2000 board set up here. We will use the Red 4 after because there's difference on the socket over there, you know. This connector here on that Rev 4 has got a wire or two. You can see that mod here on a still from a previous video I did. And whilst we're on the subject, this is another video that's coming up. It's an earlier board and you can see it's the one with the uh, dip Agnes rather than a fat Agnes. And it's like a half of the two connectors, you know, it's got one of the pair there. So if you've got one of these really old original boards that's got the original Agnes, you're going to have a huge problem trying to fit something like this. And of course, you could put it in a 3000 or a 4000. This is a 4000 daughter board here. You can see the second slot is a bit wider than the first. Yeah, uh, That was a Commodore AGA. So if you did put one of those in a 4000, yeah, you're going to lose some colour bits. It won't work properly, really, certainly with the AGA stuff. And in the clip you can see here from the 3000 bridge board, you could fit one in there as well, but like the 3000 has already got an amber, so you'd be wasting your time, really. So it makes some more sense just to test this card, I think, on a Rev 6 to start with. So just making sure it does actually still work. It's always a good thing, level playing field and all that. Yeah, there we go, that's working. But let's just try it with this in here. So. Got the wrist strap here, by the way. Let's just get that into there. What I'm going to do here at this stage is just turn it on. I'm going to put the wrist strap on properly, so I have to hold it. I'm just going to have a switch it on, just to feel here, to make sure nothing's getting nuclear. And just make sure it doesn't boot with this in place. There's no reason why that should cause it to not boot, I don't think. That said, we've got a black screen for a very long time so far. So, you know what, that is causing it to not boot. That is not what I expected at all. Let's just remove it. How can that be causing it to not boot? That's what I don't get. So, I'll put the card back in again. Let's just give it the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it was a bad connection. Oh, there we go. Why it didn't work with it in the first time, I don't know. It must have been a bad connection. But it's strange that that was causing it to not boot. Right, what I need now is a VGA lead donor. Right, so we're connected up with the VGA cable, and it's on the right channel already, and we're just getting a black screen. If I switch back to the SCART, so that's our you know normal uh, video, and if I switch to PC, which is the VGA input, at the top left, up oh, 480p, and we've got a white screen. But we've got 480p and a solid screen. So, yeah, that tells me that it's kind of doing something. We've certainly got the sync there, just no video. Now, you may think, oh, you need drivers or something. I don't think so. I think that this is just, you know, it's like amber on the Amiga 3000. It's uh, line doubling. So what that means is, you know, it's taking uh, interlace resolution, doubling it up to give you, you know, as you saw there, 480p. So it would appear that there is some sort of fault. So let me get the wrist strap on. Let's just uh, revisit this, just have a feel. Nothing is getting especially hot here. I think we'll start by reseating the chips here, clean the edge up, you know, the edge connector. It's still a white screen. I mean, it is pretty dirty, this, isn't it? You know, we've got a bent pin there. Is that a bit of solder? I don't know. I may just inspect this with magnification just to make sure I don't see any breaks. You know, this here is awful, but this is just the audio. You know, that's the volume pot. Technically, we could have a bad connection there. We've got a few scratches there. Look. Anyway, I'm going to clean it up and re-socket everything here. There's also a jump here. Do you see that? What's that for? Hmm. That could be something to do with it. You've got a jumper missing there. That would explain it. Of course, that could be for the audio. Actually, might be like left channel, right channel, ground. So, what you're going to have on here? Well, you're going to have some RAM. That's RAM, I think. A couple of gals, 7.4 series, there might be some RAM here. You know, you're going to have some, uh, I think they call it field RAM. You know, it's like super fast, high speed RAM that's just designed to hold, you know, the uh, the scan line as it flies across. Uh, you know, probably split into a number of uh, sections here. Yeah, we'll have a close look at these chips in a minute, but those are NEC-3. Yeah, that's pretty fast, but like 30 nanoseconds or something.
So I've had a gentle clean there. I'm not going to show you all of this. I'll just show you one or two of these. Uh, but I will go around all of these and just inspect the, the chips and uh, the uh, sockets. So I like that look all right. They look a bit yellowy, don't they? Uh, maybe it does just need a reseat. They look incredibly yellowy, those, actually. Maybe I need to get this in the ultrasonic. Uh, anyway, yeah, I should have been paying attention. I think pin one was to the left there. Yeah, the legs look perfect on that there. Some of these may have even been replaced, these chips. Gals are going to have a huge problem because uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get the code for those. I think if this makes no difference, I will ultrasonic it next because look again. Yellow. Why the yellow? That's weird. It could just be flux that's gone on there, but... Just looking at these, you see, there's things you can learn by looking at these chips. What I mean is, you've got three chips of the same type here. It's going to be one for red, green, one for blue. Yeah. Same here, three transistors, one for red, one for green, one for blue. If you had one missing, you'd just be missing a colour. Again, if one of these was balked, it would look weird. Yeah. So you can pretty much rule those out straight away. You could probably rule out a problem with any one of these as well. Yeah, because you get something out. You could probably rule out these as well, I think. Um, there's a few things like that. You know, it leaves little. It, it's going to be these or some of this logic here, maybe. Uh, maybe, uh, again, if those are four of the same, I'm reluctant to think any one of those would cause the problem. Passives, hmm, caps, hmm, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. So it could be A beyond us. That's a 556, five, isn't it? But you see, if the frequency is off here, what would happen there? So yeah, there could be something here. Maybe with that cap or that trim cap. Might need adjusting. Anyway, I'll continue to reseat things. So a gentle clean, as I say. Resocketed everything here. I've swapped these two around just on the basis that if this is red, green, blue, what's this? Yeah. Um, it could just be something like that, like sinks, some of the sinks are coming through one of those or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure what they are. Uh, 163, I need to check that. 161's a counter, isn't it? It's going to be something like that. Yeah, I think, uh, swapping those may be a different thing. But I've just seen uh, some photos of this on the Amiga hardware database, and it had a jumper there at the bottom. So you never know, maybe it's just missing a jumper. But obviously this is smashed off and these need replacing. So yeah, with lots of things to do, including, uh, you know, cleaning up and stuff. So let's uh, plug that in. Got the ESD wrist strap on again. Let's just uh, get it into position and get the VGA in. You know, ideally what you want with a, something like this is maybe a colour problem, some sort of speckles or something, because you then into the realms of it being a RAM for and RAM on something. Like, oh, it's working and it's line double. And if you don't believe me, let me find the remote. Let's just go back to, uh, hang on. No, it doesn't work. Oh, God. I'm getting too excited. <laughs> I'm saying that looks absolutely amazing. It does RGB on here. It looks amazing. That isn't what I expected, though. Still got a white screen. So, hmm. Blooming annoying. And actually, we've got something now. I've just messed with that trim cap. I'm just, let's just... I don't know, have a play with it again. Yeah, that's its maximum position, so... I don't know, that's not making any difference. Let's just try adjusting the variable resistor. Yeah, it's really annoying that when you touch that with a metal tool, it goes nuts. My guess is that that's what that 556 is doing. It's doing some PLL stuff or something. It's producing a clock and there's some uh, PLL stuff going on. Oh, hang on. Oh, I saw I've had it then. Right, I think the next thing we should do here is swap out some of the caps. So I'm going to target the caps that I think are related. Yeah, so the ones I would suspect straight away, that one, right next to this. Uh, Variable cap or whatever it is here, I think. That's on the supply rail, as you can see. Yeah, maybe this one. That could be coupling a signal, actually. So I think that one and that one I'm going to do first. Maybe this one, but anyway, we'll do those two and then we'll retest. These here, just going to be on supply rails. That probably to do with the audio stuff, maybe. But yeah, it's, it's this circuit here I'm interested in. 
Yeah, 35 volts, 6.8 microfarads that, but the solder points here. It looks like that's been swapped before to me. Anyway, that's what we're gonna do, those two. So I just used the uh, engineer to solder pump there, and you can see solder points. I cleaned that, that one up there, because it was a bit dirty. But we've got the cap off here, and it's ground towards the bottom. Let's just uh, check the ESR of this, it's uh, 6.8. I don't think I'm gonna have a 6.8, and this could be a super critical, but there's a variable adjustment here that connects to that. So it probably doesn't matter too much, as long as I get something within a uh, similar uh, range. So a 10 may do. Even a 2.2, 7.24 ESR, 0.94. So yeah, that's not really too far out of spec, really, is it? ESR's all right, I think. Because it goes ding ding. Yeah, round two. The ding ding means uh, it's uh, good for the range, you know, for the size of it. So that doesn't look like the issue. Let's swap this one out because, yeah, it's going over here to some components in the middle of that. I think that's not just doing a, a rail, that's actually uh, coupling something perhaps. So let's uh, let's get rid of that. Could be wrong. I didn't see which side that was. Uh oh, <laughs> it's fell out. I might need to check the footage back there. What size is that? That's a 22 microfarad. Uh, yeah, I've got my 22s here handily. Uh, I just didn't notice which way that was soldered on. So I've swapped three or four of the caps so far. I'm uh, now just going to get rid of this stupid blooming potentiometer. Just because uh, there's a mess here. Look, we've got huge blobs of solder. Someone's not used flux and the pads I think have long since gone. But uh, yeah, anyway, I figure if I just clean this up, let's get it off. It's assuming this is for volume. You never know, this might be some like adjustment from the back that changes the frequency. Wouldn't that be funny? I do with finding a manual or something for this, really. But I'm guessing that that's for volume. Looks like this goes to the TDA here, look. Which is the audio amp. So I think the next thing we'll do here, and you can see I've pulled the chip out, is desolder it. You can see some damage has occurred previously here. Can you see? The uh, pin, looks someone's melted it down there. Which is why there's a wire on here, so yeah, we can fix that later. This is a, a TDA chip here, and that TDA chip is the audio amplifier. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, we can deal with the audio stuff later. Um, uh, you can see how you know, remove that part earlier. I'm not that fussed about trying to resolve that just at this point in time on the video uh, de interlacing to be working. So I think uh, the way I'm going to approach this actually is to just heat it down here because we'll pull the socket off and replace it. Uh, and fix whatever damage has occurred. There we go, that's off. So I'll just put that out of the way with the potentiometer and stuff. And we can deal with that later. So where am I with this? Well, I spent a while tinkering around with these two variable adjustments here. I'm not getting anywhere with it. It's like you can sort of start to get a picture, but the colors are messed up and it flickers all over the place, which is ironic. It's supposed to be a, you know, remove flicker, isn't it? Well, interlacing. Um, this capacitor here, if you compare two photos, I'll stick one up, it's supposed to be a tantalum. Now I tried different uh, sizes of cap there, doesn't seem to make much of an overall difference. Now I've changed this chip here, can you see that? I got one of these because I needed one anyway for the uh, under the board. You'll see there's a board build coming up and it needs the uh, PLL because that's what that is, a PLL chip. Exactly the same, no difference at all. So I think at this stage now, what else can we do? Well, I could scope, but I'm not really sure where to scope on here. Now, it's obvious in terms of video output, you can have red, green, blue, uh, HVINC, um, VSYNC. So I could, um, did I say HVINC or HVINC? HVINC and VSYNC, I'm getting confused. So I've obviously got uh, you know RGB, HVINC and VSYNC there, so I could probe those, but I don't really know what it's going to tell me, other than one of the sinks is not right, or both of the sinks are not right. I could narrow it down if one of them looks okay and the other one's glitching, possibly, and then I could backtrack. These have been swapped around, these latches here, 574s or they or something. The RAM, I've not done anything with this, there's more RAM here. These have been uh, swapped around, these little chips, I've swapped those two, those two have been swapped around, I think I then swapped those ones around. Exactly the same behaviour, these are counters, these 163s I think. So really, we're kind of left in the realms of these two. We've got some 7-4 series here. Well, I've tried these. I've got spares of these. Exactly the same. No difference. So those are ruled out. Yeah. And there's one here. 
that's a 74 ACT 175 that's a high speed flip flop so yeah, that could be the issue so I've ordered one of those but uh, yeah the next thing I think I'm going to do before that arrives is just clean this up I'm going to put it in the ultrasonic for a few minutes and uh, give it a thorough ultrasonic because as you saw when you pull these chips out everything's yellow the pins are yellow the socket edges are yellow and it's like flux the whole thing's just like caked in flux it doesn't look too bad on the underside well it does but uh, yeah there's a lot of contamination on this so let's give it a clean and ultrasonic you seem to get more of a picture coming in as it's warmed up now that could point to caps but you know what all these have been replaced here that isn't the one unless it's totally the wrong size, maybe it's supposed to be really low, maybe it's like 0.47 instead of 6.8 microfarad, I don't know, can't find any photos other than above like that, and that's a tansel, you can't see it from any other angle to determine what size that should be, but someone definitely swapped that before because the solder points look like that there when I received it as if someone had been tinkering. These two we can swap out later, they're not coupling anything, they're just on supply rails, they really are, so that ain't going to be the issue. I fail to see the RAM causing the problems we're getting at the moment. It's more likely to be the chip I've ordered, that, you know, you could think is the first thing, the PLL, well, we've ruled it out, it's not that, or one of these. Uh, and at that point, we may need to start scoping things here to see if uh, these are behaving normally in terms of controlling signals to some of these other chips, because that might be what it is ultimately. It might be like, a, I don't know, a, a direction or an output enable or a clear or reset or something is uh, not being uh, controlled properly by one of those. So I'll just switch that on, no heat. Yeah, look how yellow the water is. Well, you may think that I got that up and running really quickly, but I did spend uh, a few days, an hour or two, uh, over a few days, checking a few things, the logic probe, uh, doing what I suggested, swapping the same chips around. So, you know, you've got some 163s, you could swap those around, the RAMs, you could swap those around. Um, I mean, the RAMs wouldn't be the issue. If you had a problem with the RAM, the colours would look wrong. I mean, the colours are a bit wrong there, actually, the white's not very white just now. But, yeah, what I mean is you'd have pixels out of place, you'd have lines, you'd have... You know, things like that, if the RAM wasn't right, flickering, etc. Specific to certain colours. So that wasn't obviously the, it didn't resolve anything. Swapping chips, no issues at all. Now you can see I've got the scope set up here. I've just been scoping up around the 564. So the 564 is a PLL. This replicates the functionality of Amber in NA3000. It uh, takes you from the 15 point whatever kilohertz up to the, what is it? Point something kilohertz. I'll stick the top left I can never remember the exact frequencies so yeah it doubles the number of lines on the screen it deinterlaces it removes the interlace lines so yeah for the most part it's now displaying and this is the thing I was trying to get to I don't know why I, I calibrated that little pot god knows how many times over the few days I messed with it and uh, I couldn't get anything like this I had the jumper there to close the uh, PLL loop because when you calibrate it you have to have it off a thing and then when you've calibrated it you stick it back on it's probably going to be the exact same it's going to work the same way as it does on a 3000 but right now it's not even on and it's working and you know what the final thing here I'm not sure whether I've fixed it whether I've not because it's got a different PLL on there it may even have one of the 74 series different because I did have one or two of those spare myself and I swapped those didn't seem to make a difference but the thing that did make a difference as I was probing around I started to see the, the image occasionally come to life but then it wouldn't animate you know so you get a single frame and I'm like what's going on here is it the impedance of the the scope here and uh, yeah I spent another 10 or 20 minutes messing around scoping things trying to make sense of it couldn't really work out what was going on and then I re remember this J300 here um, now in the manual and I tested this before it doesn't seem to have any bearing but in the manual for this it says that that jumper needs to be one way or the other now I'm sure it was in the way it suggested and it wasn't working and I tried it both ways still wasn't working but whilst it was actually on I just took that jumper off and plugged it into the position lo and behold it popped straight up and it actually works so that could indicate there's some sort of problem I mean there is a problem it's still not locking onto the frequency you see the coddles change a bit there so it's not quite calibrated there but right now I'm thinking is there actually anything wrong with this is it just that jumper's in the other position but I'm sure I tested that in both positions J300 So the next thing we're going to do here is just switch this off. Now I did this a minute ago, switch it back on and see what happens. Now it's on the RGB channel, so just bear with me a second while I switch over to the other channel. Right, so it says 576p. You saw something there. 
but I suspect this is going to do what it did a minute ago where it doesn't work and this is the bit that I don't know is a clue I guess let's just switch back to RGB and I'm sure the sticker disk in screen is up oh hang on there we go right so it's back up that's RGB right let's just switch back to PC and this is the thing right so you can see here when the tick signal is set to come from the motherboard from the CIA this is what happens it doesn't work now this is where the manual says it needs to be in the other position so if we now switch it into the other position bear in mind the Amiga is booted now I've switched that jumper to the right side and switched to the left side and then we get the display which suggests to me there is nothing wrong with this other than it needs to go into a uh, 2000 board that's been powered by the power supply it needs that 60 hertz tick from the PSU you know the 60 hertz pulse for this to work so this is an Achilles heel or the design issue I guess with this that when it's in the other position and the I think it's V-Sync it's not happy it is not a happy bunny that way you can see it's getting out of uh, sync there the PLL's not quite locking right that's probably just that trim cap needs a tiny little tweak one way or the other so I think the next thing I'm going to do actually is get the A2091 in there, booting with Booterson. Boot it up, um, we'll try a uh, higher resolution to see if that works, test a few games out. It's going to be a bit problematic because obviously I have to keep swapping that jumper over to get it to boot. And actually it may freeze booting that way now because the way this is currently set, I don't know actually, I don't know, I'm getting really confused. Because I'm thinking if there was no V-Sync now, how would this be working? I don't know, it's like, it's like we're trying to trick it into working, so I don't, I don't really know. It's uh, a minor miracle it works. Right, let's switch that on with the uh, Booty McBooterson. so the postman has just been and uh, you can see what I've ordered as a replacement here so yeah this is the volume potentiometer I removed this earlier for the audio uh, now the way this works I've also got a cable for this I was going to replace these I don't see any point in doing that the functional so this is just a, a mono 3.5 mil jack mono 3.5 mil jack it's left and right channel yeah this is where your left and right channels come out it's tapping the audio off the connector here and then you've got the audio amp there now what we'll do is we'll get that socket off because it's mangled we'll replace that put a new socket on i need to mark the tops of these caps but it's been through the ultrasonic that's why those are not marked anymore there's two of the caps to replace so we can replace those as well i think but this is functional there's actually nothing really wrong with this as things stand now the video quality there's an issue i'll show you show you that but we might be able to improve it i'm not sure yet and i think I'm, i've got a clue to what the issue is but anyway i took that off i ordered this and i was just looking at the spacing there as soon as i saw the spacing looking pretty much identical i thought that'll do that'll fit and i think that will i think that it might be a bit of a stretch might have to bend them outwards a little bit but that will fit as a perfect replacement there yeah i mean it sits uh, further uh, back doesn't it you know compared to this one so i might not be able to use the nut there that is one difference with that i think uh and i can still do it i think because there's enough thread here if you look at how that stands up yeah there's enough thread exposed there to actually mount on the plate so i'll have a go at that as well in a minute so i'm just gonna get some flux on there and clean those pads up you can see most of them have gone i think and there's very little left of them and then we just need to just get this into position here and uh, solder it on. So I've got a tiny bit of flux on the braid here. The soldering iron is up to temperature. We'll just uh, just try and tidy these up just a little bit. The pads may just come off. I honestly don't know what's going to happen here. Yeah, that feels a bit mangled, that one. I think there's only half of it there. Right, let's try and adjust these legs a little bit. So you can see the way they're bent here. They're coming out and down and that way. So if I just totally straighten these here, if I can, yeah, that works. Yeah, just totally squeeze like that. It's just pulling them out a little bit further, which is what we need. The ones on this side are doing exactly the same thing. They're coming along like that, they're going down and then out again. So we'll do exactly the same thing. We'll just totally straighten them up. 
and that should be almost right now I think it might be off by a little bit might need to just uh, spread these we can try that on that side first of all yeah you can see well, that's not far off is it that is not far off at all so with a little manipulation here there we go it's going in hey and if we just, just carefully push that into position like that there we go so if we straighten that because that's not straight is it I think that's going to do the job nicely and of course that's superior to having a plastic one like that that's why that's broke off it's had a knock and it's broken off and now I've got a uh, cap we can stick on there afterwards yeah so just trying it out with the uh, fascia there that's going to fit fine isn't it it's a shame that this seems to have been cut that way there but everything should align now once we've got the cap on here for the volume thing that's going to hold that at that point isn't it but this didn't ship with us I think someone's produced this in an attempt to create a plate for it I'm sure of it um, so yeah the thing about video you'll see the noise in a minute one of the problems is it's not got the shield around here yeah which ultimately would connect to ground and if the cable is actually taking its shielded uh, you know the shielding thing around the cores and things from there that could explain the uh, the noise you'll see you get like striations across the display yeah anyway it does look so much better after going through the ultrasonic but it's not perfect and it's been sat around for a few weeks here so there's bits of fluff and dust and yeah it needs another go after so anyway let's solder that on i think let's just push it in position and uh, solder it yeah that's not too bad so yeah here we haven't got the uh, traces of the pads so you know the pad is missing here but the trace is here so i think what we'll do here is we'll just scratch the trace here i'm doing this at a distance so it's not that easy there we go so we've got some uh, trace exposed there yeah i'm uh, also going to uh yeah what i'll do is i'll solder the wire here yeah and we'll pull the wire in line with it and then solder it on there but also wrap it around that and then do the same thing here so again the pad is missing so we'll extend the trace here and again the same thing it'll join away from there to there and then around that yeah there we go so you know we just got a little loop around that to give it a nice reliable connection and then we've got our wire just coming down I can just move that away from there a little bit that's it once that's cleaned up that'll look pretty good so I'm just going to do exactly the same thing with this one here just trail it down there so as you can see I've got some of these caps and things here these ones actually belong to Allison I think look at these uh, photosensitive resistors yeah it's amazing I used those for some of my very early projects when I was learning electronics um, yeah, but I didn't have any dual gang ones, you know, the dual uh, ones like that. I'm going to keep this. I would never use it, probably. It's broken. So I might need to stick a little bit of glue because you can see there's not much holding it on. I could stick some glue or something in there just to hold it. Yeah. Uh, but as long as it's pressed right up like that and this plate is right down like that, that should be fine. It's, uh, it's going to be okay. But if we get that off, we can replace it. So yeah, you can see where it was originally damaged by whoever messed with this in the past, but socket is looking good and those connections are fixed there. So we need to remove that, straighten that leg out, and that wire was solved on. See that pad there? There's a trace cut. That's where it goes. So it's joined anyway. I joined that back up with a bit of solder. So uh, there was never anything wrong there. I suspect that someone modified it. And we can simply just uh, get that back into it's a socket okay. yeah there we go perfect so as mentioned in annotations this video actually preceded the videos you've already seen where we did the v-sync tick fix so i did a separate video on this there's a tiny little schmidt in there that buffers v-sync and you know you can power this from the power supply and take the jumper off and have your sink going in and your sink going out buffered 
it was actually a deficiency, I think, actually, in the original design there, that when you stick a card in here, many of them, when they connect to V-Sync, they put some loading on that line, and then you end up with, I think, reflection or something. Uh, and because one of these CIAs here, probably this one, uh, takes its tick signal from that V-Sync pin when you've got it wired this way, you know, it comes from Agnes through this jumper to uh, the tick pin on one of these CIAs here. This is where you get the problem, where it just won't boot at all. You'll get a black screen, or in my case, had a, we wore a white screen at the beginning, didn't we? Yeah, it was not calibrated properly as well. And there's another issue, as you'll see. But by buffering it, the loading doesn't then affect it. Yeah, so yeah, it's well worth checking out the video for this. There'll be a link above. And the AJ Multifix series, because that was where I then, you know, finished looking at this on the, the bench here at the same time as the Multifix AGA. And between the two things, I was able to compare lots of things, lots of results, and come to understand really that it was all about V-Sync being affected by things plugged into this slot. But bear in mind, with an actual Amiga power supply, you've got a tick signal, and the tick signal comes into the power connector, yeah, and that jumper needs to be in the other position, and it goes straight through there. And I think if you've got one of those original power supplies, you probably don't have the loading issue. Yeah, well, you don't because it's not using V-Sync. Does that make sense? It's pulling tick straight from the power supply instead of from Agnes. And it's only when someone's interfering with V-Sync plugged in there that you get this issue. So a month later, this card is seriously doing my head in. I spent quite a lot of time trying to dial in the trim cap there and the little variable, well, I think is a variable resistor here. And uh, you know what? I couldn't get the picture stable at all. But before that, it was giving no display, just like it's doing right now. So you can see the yellow LED there, it's going to like power save. If I switch the system off and switch it on, you'll notice that after a second or two, hang on. In fact, it's not doing it now. Yeah, what was happening is it would, uh, if I unplug the cable, plug the cable back in, it'll give us something, look, a blue LED that is. And then it says uh, analog power saving mode. I mean, I'm trying to adjust it now, the trim cap, back to where it was roughly. It just doesn't work. It's just suddenly outputting no video again. I had this problem, like I say, before I uh, spent hours trying to adjust the blooming thing. Uh, so there's this, this something intermittent. And I'm not sure if it's the trim cap itself, to be honest, because that's the only thing we were adjusting here. I was adjusting that, and then suddenly we lost it. And then no matter where I set it, it won't come back. Right, that might explain it. As I took this off, it fell to pieces here. The plastic has gone brittle. And you can see a bit of metal. So I'm guessing the top plate is the problem. You know, the top plate is broken. There is a little mark in there that says, I don't know, uh, 2 slash 6, 2. Does that mean it's 2 peak of fire? Does it mean... I don't know what that means, so I haven't got a clue what size that is. So I've got some replacement trim caps here, 2 to 10 picofarad, I think that's a 2 to 6. Anyway, let's swap it out and see if uh, there's any life back in this again. I'm kind of expecting this to make uh, zero difference actually. I might have to start scoping things. And the crazy thing is, this is where this video uh, started. So, you know, when it came to me, it was doing nothing. And, uh, you know, I inspected a few things, measured a few things, re-socketed things, and then it started to work, but only when uh, I had the uh, tick signal set correctly. So, uh, yeah, it's anybody's guess as to whether there's a bad connection somewhere on this. Well, has, it been this has it been the trim cap all along? I guess the comedy music goes with my desoldering here, doesn't it? Although comedy is not how I would describe a super frog. Super frog seriously cheesed me off. If you saw the uh, AGA Multiplex video, you'll understand why. So it's still not working. It's doing my bleeding head in this board. Um, but I think I've made some progress. Uh, obviously the trim cap's on there now. Um, I did damage one of the pads trying to get the old one off. It was a nightmare and it crumbled to pieces even further. So yeah, that uh, trim cap was on its last legs. But as a result of it not doing anything still, I thought let's reseat the chips and clean up the legs one by one. So I worked my way all the way to the back of the card here. 
and then I don't know why I just got the instinct oh well, let's just check connectivity um, which I've done previously and on the two chips down here I'll show you in a minute there's no direct path to VCC so I'm like well maybe that's the issue so if I wedge the ground in uh, there switch it on if I measure the VCC pin on say one of the chips that's up here it's a bit hard to balance this way so there, 4.79, yeah, 5 volts is a bit low. And then the two down here, which I'll show you in a minute, 1.5 volts. Yeah, and the one over here. Hang on, if I can get onto it without shortening. 1.5 volts. So, yeah, that is the problem, I think. And incidentally, the, the reason actually I checked the connectivity again, and I've done this previously when it first arrived, couldn't work out this issue. Um, I uh, took this chip out and I was like, which way around was it? So I was like, well, let's just test ground and then check ground, I'll show you. So yeah, ground to ground, we got a beep, and then I went ground to ground. We got a beep, and then I went 5 volts to, this must be 5 volts, and I was like, huh? The resistance, why are we getting resistance? And I was like, check this one. Oh, resistance. These ones here are okay. So, I don't know. I was thinking, is it something to do with this trim cap? There's a wire mod that goes all the way up here. Uh, and I'll show you. It goes from the edge of that cap there, left side, down to uh, the bottom side of this cap. That's okay. And that's actually a ground, that wire. Hang on. I think I can get onto it. Yeah, so the fixed wire there from factory is for the ground. I don't see any corrosion or anything around here on either side. So how have these two chips here not got 5 volts? Now it's easy to assume it, this is a CMOS chip. Maybe it's uh, con the control and the voltage level there. Maybe it's done by this to adjust something. But this is a counter. It's a 7.4 series counter. A 163 I think. If it's not got 5 volts here it's not going to do very much. I think as soon as you get down to I don't know below 3.5-4 volts that's just going to stop working. So I'm tempted actually just to join a wire, and I don't know if this is a bad idea or not. I'm going to join a wire from the VCC pin here to the VCC pin there and then retest it. Well, what a surprise, it now works again. So I'm going to need to dial in that uh, trim cap. I mean, it's better for having that trim cap replaced for sure, and I'm sure that that was causing some of my problems there. Wow, the picture looks so much blooming better now as well. All right, there's massive, massive, massive jail bars down here. Uh, right, I lost the video completely when we got to the desktop, so I had to adjust the uh, trim cap again with the uh, plastic tool, and then when the video came back, there was a sweet spot right in the middle of that trim cap setting. Um, we had little lines, and I just used the little uh, variables. When I say lines, like a purple edge, you can still hear it. You might be able to sit here, uh, flickering pixels little so yeah there's some adjustment still needed there I was able to work out that I think one of the RAM chips is bad but it might not be let's just see this is also using the V-Sync tick fix that I showed in the AGA multifix video that'll be top right yeah it's looking perfect yeah we have got the jail bars but it's looking fine I actually think the RAM's all right as well yeah, crystal clear. If it wasn't for the jail bars there, I would uh, call that a complete success. The title screen here though, yeah, that's uh, interlaced. And it looks alright. There's a blue line there, can you see that? This is why I think one of the RAMs is bad on this. So anyway, I've got some PAL RAM coming, so I can hopefully swap uh, one of those out for Tom if that is a fault. Adjusting the clock here on the tracking on this monitor, we've got rid of the jail bars. That flickering, I think that's the RAM. Yeah, uh, tracking, for my reference, the clock there was 50. I changed it to 90. And, uh, yeah, the jail bars have gone. So, consider me, um, well, surprised, to be honest. Typically, with old monitors, when I saw that back in the day, it was the cable. Um, and when I said cable, the shielding and the impedance. But... And maybe it still is, but for whatever reason I've got a way to adjust it on here. The flicker is really bad there, look. Uh, yeah, I've got a way to adjust it on this monitor, so I'm quite pleased with that. The uh, lines have gone completely. Wow, that looks pretty crystal clear aside from these glitches. <laughs> That's perfect. Wow, that is really nice. Crystal clear. What a great scan double of ice. Well, it will be when we go to those uh, little glitches. Ah, now this is interesting. 
I don't know whether you can see, we've got the purple glitch in here. I've just tried, well, what's fitted now is one of the buffer chips that were causing this issue, the glitch in here, and Super Frog, you've got like speckles around the circle around him. Um, the same problems come back. Now, the chips aren't faulty. This shows the deficiency, actually, uh, some issue with certain manufacturers of those buffer chips for the DAC there. That's fascinating. The ST chips fix that, I covered that in the other video, but if you see the link top right there, I am guessing we're going to see the exact same glitches that we saw in the AG8 Multifix video. Yeah, I'm seeing the same speckling things here, not quite as prominent, but it's speckling. And the key is when Frog turns up here, there's like a ring around him, let's just see if that's speckled. Oh look at that, that's horrendous! <laughs> that is horrendous! Yeah. I'll do exactly what I did in the, that video. Yeah, so the same fix, watch, look, perfect. Remove the fix. Yeah, so there we go. I'm quite pleased about that though. It shows that the problem in the AGA Multifix video was not the card. It's not a deficiency in the design of the card. It's a deficiency in the A2000 actually. So yeah, I just need to do the final clean up there on that wire. I'm just gonna check where that wire, uh, well, might be damaged on the, you know, where the trace might be damaged on the PCB. Because what I'm not sure about is, is it supposed to be fed through a resistor or something to isolate, uh, you know, not really isolate, but um, protect with a bit of noise, maybe a ferrite bead or something. Is that what's happened here? Is a ferrite bead gone open circuit or something? Or an inductor or a resistor? But that looks crystal clear. I think Tom's going to be very pleased with that. I would be pleased with that. It's perfect on here. So I zoomed in incredibly close there. <laughs> Just look how pixel perfect that is. Yeah, he's going to be super pleased, I'm sure. And assuming the refresh rate's not so much of a problem here, you can see it's crystal clear on the desktop as well. Now it's worth noting at this point I'm testing with NTSC chips but I'll put the PAL ones back on and uh, test in a minute but yeah the, the issues with this obviously I had to do a mod, a separate video here on the uh, buffers there for the video slot that got this super crystal clear on here but also it's about the fixes and things we've applied to this card you know changing the trim cap out, fixing that wire, resolving a few things, changing the cap on the uh, PLL chip there yeah, there's perhaps a wee bit of noise on this particular monitor here, but I think it's this monitor. So let's just hit fire, let's just start the game. It's a good one to test, that's interlaced I think, crystal clear. No pixels out of place, no flickering, no shimmering, no nothing, it's uh, great. The interesting thing with this, and I'll show you this on the uh, TV you've got on the wall, there's a bit of flickering there, but that's just the screen. Um, yeah, the uh, TV you've got on the uh, wall here handles the interlace stuff perfectly actually it's got a deinterlacer built in so yeah that just looks amazing I hopefully you'll agree yeah so even the Sony Bravia gives a crystal clear picture here um, and I'm not sure this screen's interlaced but the the one before that was interlaced looked just the same as it does on the upscaler actually so yeah this old Sony Bravia is not a bad TV for this stuff but it's certainly way better in VGA here you know, you can see all the pixels perfectly. You've got a bit of blurriness on the uh, Bravia there compared to this. Yeah, this is interesting. I do think one of his RAM chips is faulty because this is how it looked to me when I first got this. Whereas when I got it first, got it working, it was like brown. I'm like, why is it brown? I actually think one of the chips is faulty. If I swap them around, the colours will change slightly there. But this should be purple, and it's not. It's just like one bit or something is missing there. So at this point in the video, I started doing some experimentation, swapping the one of the four line rams around with the other ones, removing them, seeing what the effect was. It's probably easiest to look at the Amiga 3000 schematics here, and you can sort of understand what's going on. So why have we got four of those line ram chips? You're thinking, you know, they hold eight bits each. We've got red, green, and blue, four bits for each of those. That gives us 12 bits on OCS and ECS. Yeah, 12 color bits, four red, four green, four blue, 12 bits. And each of those line rams can hold eight bits each. So four of them gives us 32 bits. And you're thinking, hang on a minute, 12 into 32, that's like 24, it gives us eight bits free. Why do we need four chips if they're eight bits each? Why can't we just deal with three chips? Well, if you look at the schematics there, you can see the issue and actually on the 3000 what they did is they put the red and green I think through one of the chips and blue for the other and you need to do that twice because you've got the 
you've got the first frame, the even frame, if you like, the non-interlace frame, and then when you're dealing with interlace mode, you've got an interlace frame. So you've got two frames that you're capturing. And each of these frame RAMs, it's the same as the line RAM. It's got like a read enable, a write enable, and a read clock and write clocks, signals like that basically that clock the data through. So you've got to be able to separate the first frame, yeah, from the interlaced frame. So you've got to split the interlaced stuff into its own chips and the non-interlaced frame into its own chips, if you see what I mean. And from looking at this, we can work out what's going on here, actually. This is the chip that when I tested it in the um, AGA Multifix, gave me some issues and I was like, oh, there's an issue with that one. The other three didn't do that. So when this was in this position here, we got colour problems, which is interesting because when this was not populated, the colours looked all right. But anyway, now it's in this position here. If I look at the underside, you can see the corner pins are where you've got four bits in and out on each chip. And we've got traces on all these three chips here. And this one here, we've got traces on that side, traces there, and on this top corner here, the, the colour bits there are not used all four of those top pins there and all four of those pins there are not used so yeah this chip has a fault the x i'm going to leave on it i'll clean the other ones i'll stick a label on it so you know faulty lower bits or upper bits which other ones these are the ones up this side here but they're not going anywhere either on the top or the bottom side of the board that's how this is working perfectly with a faulty ram and uh, strangely interlaced mode is working all right but we've got like a, a weird colored sort of yellow band at the top there I guess really I need to test a game or something. Yeah, so the colours do look a bit strange there. So yeah, there is a problem, definitely with one of those RAM chips. You know, the yellow thing at the top there is the clue, but this should be like white and it's kind of like dark grey. You know, we had brown before, it looked like a dark brown, so we got some colour bits missing there in interlace mode. So one RAM chip is definitely bad. But you know what, I might actually just try what I was going to do, which is to swap four of the bits around. I'll stick a little adapter in there, see if we can get that looking a bit better. It doesn't look too bad there, but it's a bit darker than it should be. I think that's the, my takeaway point here. I mean, the whites look good, but it is a bit darker than it should be because of that bad ram. So testing without one of the smaller chips now, <laughs> this is where I get really confused. And uh, yeah, back into workbench, back into prefs. Let's just change it to interlace mode here. Repel laced, use. Ah, hang on. No, it's no different. It's dark like it was before, but that's interlaced. We've got one of the RAM chips missing. How, how is that working? Because what, what I was expected to see here is a colour missing. And somehow we're not missing a colour. And it looks exactly the same as it did with the chip. And, and if you don't believe me, here's the chip. If I switch it off. Yeah, it's, it's not here. It's missing. Let's, let's remove that one and see what happens, but I'm sure these are four bits each, and we've got 12 culverts. Yeah, this is 7-4 series. We've got the gals here. 7-4 series. I'm getting brain ache. Right, we've now got two chips missing. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe one's not responsible for each colour. Remember, this is the issue again. So it's almost like you've got... Uh, one of the red bits going through the first chip, and then a green bit, and then a blue bit. So when you remove one chip, all you do is you lose a few colour bits. Mm, yeah, that would make more sense again. So it's not like this one for red, one for green, one for blue. The colour bits are just going all over the blue in place through these chips. See, if I was going to do it, that's how I would do it. I'd route all the red bits through one, the green bits through another, the blue bits through another. Because then it gets it's easier to diagnose, you get a fault, you're like, well, which chip is it? Well, I don't know, it's like, which colour bit is it? You've got to start scoping things and... Yeah, you see, look, it's now got two chips missing, which I find absolutely incredible, because, again, how is it still working? I res laced. Use. Yeah, look at that now. Now we've got what looks like missing scan lines here, and it's like a pinky sort of colour. So, yeah, that's what it is. The co different colour bits are going through the different chips there. And I'm guessing that that field, uh, I'm trying to think about this, that field RAM probably only kicks in for the interlaced frame. So you're only going to notice a problem with those chips, those three small ones, I think, in interlaced mode. But that is why we're now getting like uh, scan lines appearing here. It's quite a nice effect, actually. If you could uh, do that for each colour, you could just like remove the uh, thing, you could have scan line effects. 
And in fact, we could take that to the next level. If I remove the other chip, I suspect we'll just have scan lines. Pal high res laced, so I'm guessing we're going to get full on scan lines. Oh, yes! I like it. Obviously, we lose the, <laughs> the de flicker situation. It's flickering probably because we're getting an inconsistent state on that. If you're going to test without that, what you would need to do now is have a pull down resistor on each of the colour bit outputs. Yeah, I think. But then again, you've got some output control going on there so you perhaps wouldn't want to pull them down all the time so mm, what are you gaining? You're just gaining your flickers back. Well, let's just try it with agony, I'm just curious to see what it looks like. You could easily do that, you could just have some pull downs or something there, maybe. Yeah so we've got scan line type effects there but it is flickery. It don't look bad actually, it's kind of looking aliased. So just testing three of my new chips here. Yeah, it looks exactly the same there. It is still a bit darker, so ah, that is a bit strange, isn't it? It's just marginally darker. Oh, hang on a minute. Yeah, the darker thing is because of the other RAM, isn't it? That's right. It's the. It's, I'm getting confused. It's not the field RAM that's making it darker. It's the balked chip, which we will swap for Tom. Anyway, those three chips of mine work fine, so I'm pleased with that. So with the knob here, I chopped off the extended uh, bottom to this. I've just filed it down here in this orientation. It's pretty smooth, but we've just got a bit of unevenness here where it's the you know the point where it joins. So I'm just very gently just going around, and there's very little to shave off, and it it um, files down really easy. This plastic. So that's gone right on there, so uh, it stays on really well and holds this thing on the back here. Obviously this one here is smashed, but uh, yeah, this does actually work. Um, I've got a cable to test this with in a minute, so uh, I'll do that next I think. I'll just show you that the, the sound output's working here, the verbal resistor's working, and uh, yeah, we're all done pretty much. So I've got headphones plugged in there. Bear in mind, you could destroy a set of headphones with an amplifier like that, and if they adjust the volume, yeah. So that's one channel, which is why it doesn't sound right, that's bubble bubble. So just unplug it and plug it into the other channel. There we go. And again I can adjust the volume. Down or up. So yeah, the audio stuff is fixed as well. So my advice to Tom is if he wants to secure using this plate, just maybe drill one hole here and put a screw and nut through there like that. We've still got the, one of the rams to swap out here so we'll do that next but you know quickly come on the underside it's a bit streaky but you know I cleaned off the uh, uh, flux there where I added that wire and we got two fixed wires there uh, related to the uh, you know the damaged uh, potentiometer. Yeah, pin one is up the top here so let's just try a new chip in that position. I'm hoping that just fixes it but it might be that one, might need to just swap these uh, chips around. So I decided to uh, logic probe the two RAM chips that I was questioning here. One of them obviously has got a cross on it that I thought was bad, and I'm not so sure. I've just targeted the other one, um, because the one that was seemed to do nothing actually when we removed it. Um, that was before we tested the, the interlace stuff. Um, and that's because there was no activity on one side, there was like, on one corner I could see some input stuff and just lows on the output, which makes me think the chip I've just swapped for an NTSC chip is probably the uh, the one that's faulty. So let's just see if that now looks any better with an NTSC chip. Oh, laced. Yeah, there we go, the colours are normal again. So yeah, that is the issue. Yeah, so that was that chip there, the one that seemingly did nothing when we tested earlier. And the one with the cross on it is actually all right. The reason that played up is the issue with the two four fours in the other board. That's all it was. So I can wipe the marks off these. The chip that's here is faulty. And what I was doing is logic probing here, and I saw activity, 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 activity on all four pins on the top. The bottom side is the output, all low. So uh, yeah, I then went round the others and thought, is the one of these where that side's not used? Well, there's this one here, but then it goes brown. So I'm guessing that the same side on this one is balked, actually, now I think about it. That makes sense, because it was brown when this chip was there. But then again, when this chip's here, 
Ah, oh, hang on, yeah, this makes more sense to me now. This chip isn't balked. When this chip here with this balked thing is here... Oh, hang on a minute, but these sides aren't used on this one. Oh, I don't know, I'm getting confused. It's probably a case, I think, that this chip's got an issue, that chip's got an issue. The chip here's got an issue with the bits up, uh, that aren't used somewhere or something, I don't know. Uh, but this one is the one that's just made the display go perfect, swapping it for an NTSC chip. So you can mix and match these. A PAL a card like this, if it's got PAL RAM, you can swap it for NTSC RAM and it'll work okay. I think the only difference is the number of uh, pixels, you know, I think you've got a slightly wider uh, number of, larger number of pixels, haven't you? on um, NTSC. The frequency is obviously slightly different but it just seems to work. There's no issue there. I think it's all just about the size. Um, and it's probably the same with this. I'm not sure whether this RAM comes in different flavours, you know, power NTSC or not. I, I was thinking this side here was not used and it's not used up here but it must be used, you know, there must be traces that are laid out on the top side here for that one. This one here though, that uh, whole side isn't used but we get brown when we swap them around. So here we are at the desktop again, I swapped the other chip around and the desktop's looking fine. So, fingers crossed, this should look crystal clear in insulation. Hey, it's fixed. It's fixed. So yeah, there was one bad RAM chip on there. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's going to convey the colours properly, but that's not as dark as it was. And the, the band that was at the top is gone. It's just one solid colour. So yeah, very pleased. Everything looks different here, the colours you know, it's like one bit, it was like one colour bit, it was maybe a bit greenish before. Now it's crystal clear, colour's correct, no band at the top, spot on. So hopefully Tom will be a happy bunny. Yeah, this will be winging its way back to you Tom. We'll wrap the video up now I think. And it's also worth checking out the AJ Multifix series because we did some work with these buffers here and improvements. And on the, the Rev4 board here, adding a capacitor onto one of the clock signals and again both those things can improve the video output with anything that goes into the video slot here. Now the thing is with this because it is partial it's like one or two colour bits on one side you know you've got like four bits go in four bits go out on each corner of the chip here you know it's plus eight colour bits and because the Amiga is four bit as soon as you get like three of these well you've got quite a lot of bits haven't you you know you've got eight 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 uh, and this is the thing, so, you know, uh, 4 times 3 is 12, 12 times 2 is 24. You've got some bits unused when you use these in an Amiga. So, actually, I might be able to use this on another project I've got coming up. It depends on, you know, which side, only one side of this is faulty. So, yeah, it's, I wouldn't put something like this in the bin, you may be able to use it. So, just wrapping up here. Huge thanks to Tom Meads for letting me have a look at this. You saw the video output, he's really good on this actually. Yeah, so we've replaced the trim cap here. It's a full recap because all the caps were replaced early on. It's got a new volume potentiometer here. We obviously had to fix the traces here because someone had boxed those previously. Yeah, solder points were reflowed on various things here. We replaced the socket there, fixed the trace on the uh, TDA, you know, audio op amp. We fixed the trace under here that meant, uh, you know, this was now getting 5 volts. Yes, the top of that there is smashed off, but it works. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that the lid, the solid is, so there's no big deal there. And, and of course, you could just replace that, but it's about the uh, alignment here. Trying to get a component with that set of pads to that spacing is impossible. So you'd have to drill holes for a replacement and then put wires, and it'd just be a bit bodgy. So it's better, in my mind, to just leave that as is. And it tells a bit of the story, the history of this, I guess. Um, and obviously we replaced that RAM there. That's brand new. Anyway, I do hope you found the video interesting. If you'd like to support the channel, please see the coffee and Patreon links down below. You can also join as a YouTube member, and we've got some merch. I'll catch you in the next video.